you for watching our Zoom discussion about the first 100 days of COVID-19 in Delaware and in the U.S. Today, my guests and I will talk about what we've experienced in our state and in the country, the lessons we've learned, and what we are putting in place for the future. I'm Dr. Kara Odom-Walker, Cabinet Secretary for the Delaware Department of Health and Social Services. Joining me today are my public health director, Dr. Carol Rattay, who has been on the front line of Delaware's response since the first week of February, when we faced question after question from Delaware's Joint Finance Committee during our agency's budget hearings. I still remember that day. Also joining us to provide a national perspective is Dr. Lena Wen, an emergency room physician and public health professor at George Washington University. She previously served as Baltimore's health commissioner. I also want to acknowledge our ASL interpreter, Pamela Tokyo. Last week, we passed the 100-day mark since we announced the first presumed case of COVID-19 in Delaware. That milestone made me think back to eight simple words that Dr. Rate said early on. This is a marathon and not a sprint. How right Dr. Rate was and still is. When we look back to that March 11th date, the day that we announced a 50-something man associated with the University of Delaware community was our first presumed case. We could not have known how many Delawareans we would lose to COVID-19, how many people would become infected with the virus, and how all of our lives would change so drastically because of this pandemic. As tired as well we all might be with the virus, the virus is certainly not tired with us. As Governor Carney, Dr. Rate, and I have said since early on, we need to remember the virus is still here. We need to all act as if we are infected. And today we add these words, please get tested. That is how we are going to protect the most vulnerable among us. To keep our neighbors, our family members, and ourselves safe, there are five things we can all do. Continue to wear face coverings in public when social distancing cannot be maintained. Practice social distancing and avoid big crowds. Wash our hands often and use hand sanitizer. This one is really important. We need to stay home when we're sick. And lastly, we need to get tested regularly, especially if we've been exposed to crowds, have symptoms, or just want to know our COVID-19 status. Now that we're more than 100 days into this pandemic, our advice continues to be simple. We need to continue working at keeping ourselves and others safe and healthy. Now for a national perspective on the first 100 days of COVID, I'd like to bring in Dr. Lena Wen, an emergency physician and public health professor at George Washington University. Dr. Wen previously served as Baltimore's health commissioner. Dr. Wen. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. It's a pleasure to join you today and uh, Dr. Rate and all your colleagues. And um, I first want to commend you for your incredible leadership and service, Secretary Walker. And it's a pleasure to know you as a colleague and a, uh, and a friend um, working on the front lines of public health. So we are unfortunately seeing some very concerning trends nationally. Um, and it's actually hard to imagine that we've only been in this, as you were saying at, at, the, at the outset, Dr. Walker, uh, 100 days, that um, looking back even six months ago, we didn't even know the name of this new disease that was going to change all of our lives of COVID-19. We have gone through a lot. And when we look back at where we were back in March and in April, we know that COVID-19 was really hitting the New York City area, the New York metro area, particularly hard. Well, the New York area was able to avoid the worst, the, um, the catastrophe that could have happened by working to do so-called flatten the curve. They were able to implement shelter in place orders, very aggressive orders in order to contain the infection. And the hope was that by all of us sheltering in place, by all of us doing this, what we call the blunt instrument of shutting down our economy and people going through incredible sacrifices of in many cases losing their jobs, kids not going to school, that we would be able to reduce the number of infections to a low enough level and at the same time, built up enough public health capacity when it comes to testing, contact tracing, isolation, that we would be able to rein in the infection by the time that reopening occurs again. 
But unfortunately, we have seen that reopening occurred very quickly in many parts of the country and without having these capabilities in place enough. And so we are seeing surges, rises in the number of cases in, um, in nearly half of our states. And very concerningly, in multiple states, we are also seeing a rise in hospitalizations as well. The hotspots that we're seeing include Texas, Arizona, Florida, and in these states too, in addition to seeing the hospitalizations rise, we're also seeing the ICU, the number of patients requiring intensive care rise as well. And there are even reports in some of these states that ICUs are reaching capacity and patients are now being diverted to other, to other hospitals. Now, why is this concerning? Well, this is the same pattern that was seen in the New York area at the peak of, um, or just before they reached the peak of their epidemic there. And I worry, and I think all of us are worried about what this could mean to the parts of the country that are seeing these surges now. Um, now, um, I think all of us, you know, it's important for us to always look forward and understand that what's coming to us is not inevitable that there are things that each of us can do, each of us in the areas that are seeing these surges and each of us in the other areas. And I think that Dr. Walker laid out very well the steps that each of us can take now. And in addition to everything that she said about getting tested, about um, using um, a, and continuing to wear masks and wash our hands, I would also add that we need to think about our own values and our own risks. We can't stay inside, sheltered in place, not see anyone or do anything forever, right? We're not going to do this for years until there might be a vaccine. There are things that we are going to start to do, whether it's seeing family and friends, if that's the most important thing, or going grocery shopping or going back to work for, for those who need to. But there are ways for us to reduce risk. Just because things are reopened doesn't mean that you have to do it all. Um, just because um, you are now going back to work doesn't mean that you can't take every precaution and do everything you can to keep safe. Because at the end of the day, yes, there, of course, there is a responsibility by our government, by our policymakers, but there's also this individual responsibility. And it's only by all of us working together at this time that we're able to protect ourselves, our loved ones, and everybody around us. So keep up that physical distancing as much as you can. Continue with mask wearing, good hand and face hygiene, and we will work together in order to, in order to save lives. Back over to you, Dr. Walker. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen. And again, thank you for your leadership and sharing your guidance nationally. We so appreciate your voice and I appreciate your friendship over the years. From the national landscape, let's now shift to looking at the first 100 days of COVID-19 in Delaware and what lies ahead for us. So for that, I'm gonna to turn to my division director, Dr. Carol Vote, who leads our division of public health. Thank you so much, Dr. Walker. And, and thank you, Dr. Wen. Uh, first, I really um, want to say to Dr. Walker, congratulations on your on your new and exciting position with Nemours as Senior Vice President and Chief of, of Population Health. Um, I have loved getting to work with you in Delaware and I'm so incredibly grateful that you have been with us for the last three and a half years, but um, especially during this pandemic. That being said, we are so excited to continue to work with you to help Delawareans be healthy and especially Delaware's kids. So looking back actually beyond 100 days because we all became really aware in early January that something was going on in China. And although there were a lot of unknowns early on, including whether there was even person to person spread, um, you know, we, we started to uh, mobilize. And in the middle of January, the Division of Public Health State, State Health Operations Center activated to level one, uh, beginning to have regular meetings um, among, amongst ourselves and with our partners uh, to really get a, a, ourselves ready, uh, working with schools, hospitals, um, working to increase um, PPE into our state. Um, but um, I too remember the day of our budget hearing when the Joint Finance Committee wanted an impromptu briefing on, on COVID-19. And that was the same day that Dr. Nancy Messonnier from CDC told us all that we need to be ready for a significant disruption in our lives. Um, I think that was a, 
a startling but important day for people to begin to think about how things were going to change for us. And it was really less than two weeks later that we did have our first case here in Delaware. At that point, we were activated to our state health operation center level three. Um, and we uh, mobilized quickly to respond to the first case at University of Delaware that came from a, a dinner party in Princeton. Uh, there were six associated cases. Um, and early on, we were able to keep track of of uh, contact tracing in our in our state, but in Delaware, like many states, um, we quickly became overwhelmed with an increasing number of state of uh, cases. And by the time of our unfortunate first death, which was less than two weeks later, um, we already had almost two hundred cases in Delaware. Shortly after our first case. Governor Carney and, um, and Delaware really leaned into um, staying at home and, and the, the appropriate um, approaches to decrease the spread of infection. Some of that was though driven by um, recognizing that even though we were providing a lot of guidance to stay at home and social distance, we saw massive parties um, on St. Patrick's Day weekend, and we saw um, crowded bars, um, crowded beaches, and, and the governor knew that um, we needed to not only put um, stay-at-home orders in place, but also um, out-of-state quarantine shortly thereafter, because um, we also saw a lot of out-of-staters coming to, uh, to our state from higher risk um, higher infection areas. Um, go the governor, Governor Carney was really um, so focused on and really understood the importance of being able to flatten the curve. And uh, between all of the different orders that were put in place and the hard work that Delawareans did to stay at home, we did flatten the curve. We saw though um, a number of um, very serious and heartbreaking situations along the way. We've seen more than three quarters of our deaths be among individuals who live in long-term care settings, which has been very heartbreaking. Our most vulnerable populations have been deeply impacted by this. Additionally, we as a state addressed a significant hotspot in Sussex County related to our meat packing or our poultry plants and the associated Latino community, very, very high rates of infection and morbidity and even some mortality associated with these high rates of infection. We also saw some really heartwarming collaboration with partners, our hospitals in Sussex County and across the state coming together, our FQHCs, our community partners, all coming together to support our Sussex County Latino community to get testing and to help people safely isolate and protect themselves. And we saw the result, results of that, which were um, a great decrease in spread of infection. And now, although Sussex County at that point had the highest number of cases, now Sussex County cases are uh, one of the lowest in. Um, in the state. Testing has been a challenge for us as we have uh, traversed this, this journey, but through collaboration, we have been able to sustain access to testing. Initially, only symptomatic people were able to be tested, but um, grateful again to our hospitals across the state, every single hospital provided testing sites, and we were able to assure that people had testing uh, in, to the degree, in fact, where Delaware has been in the top of states uh, for testing uh, across the nation. We have evolved with our testing strategy, and now at this point, testing is available to anyone. And of course, we continue to promote testing for those who are at highest risk, those who are symptomatic, um, those who have been exposed, those who are in high risk occupations, um, and those um, in our vulnerable populations. 
and we will continue to evolve our testing strategy so that everyone across the state has easy access uh, throughout the week, um, easy hours, easy geographic locations, um, so that uh, we can ensure that people have testing available to them when they need it. Last, I'll touch on contact tracing. As I mentioned, um, you know, we, we've never seen anything like this in public health and contact tracing is an important public health tool that we use all of the time. But very quickly, our numbers of cases increased and our epidemiologists were not able to keep up with contact tracing. But in the last couple of months, we have been able to stand up a, an incredibly robust contact tracing system through the help of the National Guard. Everyone since early May has been contact traced. Um, and um, later this week, we're going to be um, launching our um, contact tracing system that will remain with us throughout the rest of this pandemic um, in partnership with, with NORC, NORC, and Innovational and uh, many, many state partners. Um, contact tracing, we're, we're proud to say, is um, meeting the needs in our state. Uh, but we do have some worries. One of the worries is uh, people don't want to tell us everything that's going on in their lives and who all that they have contact. And we also worry greatly that, um, as Dr. Walker said, people are tired of this virus. And we know that uh, face coverings and social distancing are so incredibly important for us being able to stay open. Um, but we know that people are tired of um, wearing face coverings and social distancing. And so um, we have work to do as we gear, as we uh, head towards um, a fall and winter season where uh, we are planning for a second wave and we're also worried about influenza. So I will stop there and I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Walker. Thank you so much, Dr. Rattay, and thank you for your tireless efforts for serving beside me. I can't imagine going through this with anyone better. Delaware is very fortunate for your service and commitment. So we have a lot of questions. We will get started. Uh, the first one is certainly um, well suited for this public health transition. For both of you, Dr. Wen and uh, Rattay, during the congressional testimony yesterday, Dr. Fauci mentioned our progress on a possible COVID-19 vaccine. He told the Congressional Committee that a vaccine could be ready by the end of this year, or maybe by the beginning of 2021. Uh, it just a sense, uh, I'll turn to Dr. Wen first, do you think that timeline is realistic? And if it is, how long do you think it would take to have enough vaccine doses for everyone in the U.S.? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and I know that's something that everyone has been following. And I want nothing more than for Dr. Fauci, um, for his optimistic estimate to be correct. Um, and I, I remain hopeful. Right? I trust Dr. Fauci. I remain hopeful. Um, I, I do think it's important for us to keep in mind a few things. One is that for us to have a vaccine within a year um, or a year and a half would be the fastest that a vaccine has ever been developed. The, the previous record holder was about five to six years for the, the development of a vaccine. And I do want us to, to just remember that and keep that in mind. The other is that, as you mentioned, Dr. Walker, that it's not just a matter of getting the vaccine and, um, and ensuring that it's safe and effective. It also needs to be manufactured and distributed. Um, because it's not the vaccine that's going to save your life, it's the vaccination. And that will also take time and coronation to occur. And then the third thing is the vaccine that's developed may not be 100% effective. In fact, most vaccines are not. Think about the flu vaccine. Every year we recommend for everyone to get the flu vaccine, it is 40 to 60% effective. Now, everybody should still get it, but we need to just have that expectation too that the vaccine that's developed for COVID may also be partially protective, not entirely protective. And all that, what that means is that, yes, we need to keep up our hope for a vaccine, but we still probably will need to live our lives even after the vaccine is developed in a way that reduces our risk and continues with these good public health hygiene measures because these are the tools at our disposal for preventing further transmission of this virus. 
Dr. Tay, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, the one thing I'll add that, I mean, that was, uh, I, I think, a, a terrific answer. And um, the one thing I'll add is um, we, we are hopeful as well. We are, you know, concerned. We have the same concern, but at Public Health, we are um, doing everything we need to prepare for the implementation, widespread implementation of the vaccine when it does get here. So, um, you know, our goal will be as soon as it's available, you know, we know it won't be available for everybody at once. And so making sure that it, it's uh, most available for the, the highest priority groups um, initially, but um, public health stands ready to uh, get that vaccine out there and, and get it to people as, as soon as it is available. Thank you so much. So uh, this next question is also for Dr. Rite. Yesterday during the weekly briefing, uh, Governor Carney, our DEMA director, AJ Shaw, and you all mentioned the slowdown in testing in Kent and Sussex counties. It's certainly beach season and many people are out enjoying the nice weather and the beaches. How concerned are you about the trend of a slowdown in testing? And why do you think this is happening in our state? Yeah, um, so it, it, it is interesting when the um, supply was low, the demand was high. And now that um, the supply is, is adequate, uh, the demand has uh, has decreased. I think those who most wanted to get tested have. Um, you know, previously we had very high rates of testing. Over 10% of Sussex County um, had been tested, and um, so you know, perhaps there's a little bit of testing fatigue there. But um, as we have seen over the past couple of weeks, increased cases related to um, beach activities like Senior Beach Week. Um, we do see some increased interest in, in, in testing. And um, from our perspective, it's, it's really important that, um, that testing be very accessible to people. So we're gonna keep moving on that front and also keep working with the highest priority groups like the highest priority employer groups uh, to make sure that they have a plan in place to ensure that their employees are testing kind of like we're doing with, with long-term care where um, testing is um, occurring once a week for, for staff. Um, we're, we're now beginning to work more closely with other employers uh, to ensure that highest risk employees have testing opportunities. Thank you so much. The next question is for Dr. Wen. We're reading about these record high infection cases almost every day in states like Arizona, Florida, Texas, South Carolina. And yesterday, uh, Dr. Fauci reinforced that the next two weeks are critical to slowing the surge of the virus. How do you see what's happening in the U.S. right now? Yeah, I, I am concerned um, because this is not where ideally we should be at this point. And I think about the sacrifices that so many made during the last round of shutdowns. And I just would not want all those sacrifices to be in vain because frankly, I do think that we have squandered that time. And I don't mean you know, I, I don't mean all of us as individuals. I think so many people have given up so much. There have been so many elected and um, and appointed um, um, leaders on all levels of government, including you, Dr. Walker, who have done so much, and your entire team who have done so much for for the, the residents of Delaware, as everything you can in order to um, to protect them and, um, and and their safety. But unfortunately, we don't have the national infrastructure that we need when it comes to testing, contact tracing, isolation. Um, and I look at these states that are facing these rapid surges, these rapid escalations, and they are proposing now um, some important, but unfortunately fairly minor measures for, um, for trying to, to reduce the spread of the infection. And so they are now, for example, recommending masks um, and are recommending that people stay at home, but I worry that this is not enough, that we are going to see, um, unfortunately, preventable infections and preventable deaths um, in multiple parts of the country. And of course, we know that this is a disease that knows no boundaries. And um, as Dr. Fauci said in his congressional testimony yesterday, um, as there are more young people who are getting sick, 
we cannot just be saying, well, young people don't worry about it because they don't get as sick. That may be true, but first of all, young people do get very sick, but also the dynamics of the disease will change if there are more people who are now infected and spreading it to others. And if more people are infected in certain parts of the country, it will spread to others too. And so again, I don't think we should take this as inevitable. We need to see this as a call to action for all of us, for policymakers and also for us as individuals. Thank you, Dr. Wen. And I'll just extend that to Delaware. We know that uh, certainly our cases are spreading among young people and we're really worried about um, making sure that everyone is continuing to stay safe, particularly as they start to engage in new sports or celebrate graduations. We're really monitoring trends at the beach where younger people may be uh, getting more infected. And, and those trends, just as you said, can put others at risk who may be more vulnerable and need additional healthcare support. So I think it means we all have to continue to uh, protect ourselves and manage those risks as we go about our everyday lives and re-engaging in activities that we're excited about. But it goes back to your comment around balancing values with risks in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, this next question is, uh, is for both of us, Dr. Rate and, and, and for uh, me. Delaware seemed to survive the first wave of COVID-19 and flattening the curve successfully. Now we're building up contact tracing, and you mentioned that we didn't have that when the virus first hit the state. How do you see that making a difference this summer and in advance of what we might see in the fall? Yeah, I mean, so the, the goal is for any case in the community, ideally we identify it as early as possible. We have that person isolate, we have that, um, person identify and share any of their potential contacts, which would be individuals that they've spent uh, 10 minutes or more, less than six feet away from. And uh, then that we identify their contacts and their contacts um, are in quarantine um, until we know that they, um, they do not have the infection or they would go to isolation if they do become a case. Um, it's, it's one of the most important tools we have right now to contain this virus. It's really a tool that helps us so we're not quarantining the entire state. It allows us to just quarantine uh, those who are potentially exposed. You know, one of our greatest concerns though, as I, I previously mentioned, is um, we've already been seeing that there are even cases that don't really wanna be contacted. Um, but many cases um, aren't excited about telling us who their contacts are either. And what we hope that the public can understand is, is this isn't about, you know, any, nobody's out to get anybody else. Um, but what we really are focused on is trying to control the spread of the infection so we can stay open and only quarantine those exposed as opposed to the entire population again. Thank you. Um, I think this is a, a part of our work that is ramping up so quickly and will put us in a better place to prevent a potential large peak in the fall, but it does take everyone's participation and, and active engagement. If you get a call, please answer it and please help us do our best. Um, this next question, uh, I'll go to Dr. Rate again. Um, someone asked, my 75-year-old dad would like to dine outside at his favorite restaurant. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Oh, that's a tough one. So really, we are recommending that those in the higher risk group, those over 65 and those with underlying health conditions, uh, continue to stay at home. That being said, we've seen that um, that advice not be followed. Um, again, I I want to stick with, we would recommend staying at home. If you are refusing to comply with that and you really, really want to enjoy going out to dinner, you need to assess the risk. First of all, 75, you could be a very healthy 75 year old. Um, you're still at risk because of age, but if you also have underlying conditions like diabetes, like cardiovascular disease, like, uh, uh, being treated for cancer and being immunocompromised, then we strongly recommend that you don't go out. But if you do, outdoors is certainly better than indoors. 
uh, wearing a face covering at all times. Um, maybe take it off when you're eating, of course, uh, but um, otherwise keep it on and, and stay distanced from other people. Um, those are things you can do to uh, decrease your risk. Thank you. I've definitely told my dad no restaurants anytime soon. Um, so Dr. Wen, we'll turn to you next. So every year this person said, I get my flu shot and I know how important it is to me and my family and to the overall public health in Delaware. Do you expect to see more people getting their flu shot this fall? And do you think that the country will have enough uh, for us to proceed in that direction? Yeah, I'm glad um, to hear that you're talking about the flu shot. I certainly um, would ab absolutely encourage people to get their flu shot anyway, right? We should all be getting our flu shot. Even though it sounds like 40 to 60% effective, is that really effective? Some people still get the flu despite having the flu shot. But if you can reduce your chance um, by 50% of getting the flu, that's something that you should absolutely be doing anyway. And it's particularly important this year. We are already seeing a rise in the number of cases of COVID-19. We expect to see more this winter season because coronaviruses in general have a seasonal effect. And then we're also going to have the dual effect too of the flu season happening at the same time as a likely resurgence of COVID-19 come the fall. And so for all, um, so it, um, so it's, I think, even more important than before to get your flu shot this year. And I know that's something that um, all of our public health leaders are attentive to. Um, Dr. Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC, testified about the importance of the flu shot yesterday um, at the congressional hearing, as an example. And I certainly hope that that's something that everyone, um, um, that, uh, that the preparations are being made for more flu shots, but that everyone really um, um, heeds those words of advice and, um, and, and get the flu shot this year. Yeah. Thank you. So this next question, I'm going to turn to the pediatrician among us. Uh, Dr. Rite, uh, we've gotten a couple of questions about kids and whether they are at increased risk and whether we should think about vacations this summer differently or even school reopening. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so when you look at our testing, uh, our case numbers, um, we do see um, less cases among kids. What we don't know right now is that because we're not testing them as much. We know we're not testing them as much because we know kids are less likely to be symptomatic, but um, we do have over 500 cases of kids who have, uh, had COVID-19 in our state, and we've even had some who've had more severe consequences. Um, so there is a concern. One of the other concerns is kids go home and kids live with um, or spend time with others who are more vulnerable. And so kids can spread the infection um, even if they do not become as ill. Um, we're working closely with the Department of Education. Um, you know, when we're balancing all public health factors, right, education is so important. And we do not want our children to get further behind in, in school. There's some thinking that even just missing and doing virtual learning in the, in the spring may have impacted their education. So we want to do everything we can to help kids get back to school safely in the fall. We have a lot of ideas about how to do that, um, but uh, we also have to pay attention to the data in our state and um, make sure that we are able to keep this virus um, contained um, and at lower levels um, before those final decisions are made. As far as vacations, there's a lot of safe vacations that we can all take. If we um, if we abide by precautions, um, I say take a vacation this summer if you can. Thank you so much. So I'll take the last question. I know we're running short on time. Uh, it's a question about indicators and what indicators will we look at during the summer to help us understand what will happen in the fall and winter. And I'll say that Delaware will continue to put information out on our dashboard. Please continue to listen to our press briefings 
make sure you're visiting Healthy Communities Delaware to see where the trends are and stay tuned to uh, the latest information and guidance that's out there. We will continue to look at a balance of measures around the public health impact, the rate of infection, and the number of in increasing cases, but also those indicators of hospital supply, whether hospitalizations or ICU stays continue to increase will be an indicator of what we may see. We hope to decrease the number of cases in the summer and over the next few weeks with contact tracing, uh, but certainly it will give us uh, important clues as to what we'll see in the fall. So I just want to say uh, to my guests, thank you so much, Dr. Lena Wen, Dr. Carol Kay for joining me today. Thank you to our ASL interpreter, Pamela, for doing a tremendous job every time we do these sessions. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast today. Uh, this will be our last weekly DHSS Zoom for a little while, but we'll be back as needed. And for everyone in Delaware, please consider getting tested for COVID-19. Whether you have symptoms, may have been in contact, if you've been out of your house and think that you may need uh, to be tested because you were exposed, please get tested. You can find convenient, even free testing near you by going to de.gov backslash COVID testing. Or you can call your doctor for a referral. And if you don't have a doctor, please call Delaware 211. I also want to encourage anyone, continue to reach out to us if you need additional help for social services, such as food, housing, transportation, or getting items delivered to your home. We want everyone to stay safe, particularly our older neighbors, please call Delaware 211 if you need assistance. For the latest updates on COVID-19 in Delaware, go to de.gov slash coronavirus. Thank you for joining us. Please stay safe. Please be well. And remember, get tested.